um, that this is out there. Um, this being my uh, Twitter feed, you're like, dude, I don't want to subscribe to Twitter. That's fine. You don't have to. You're like, dude, I don't want to go clear to that e-companion website because it's a pain in the butt to get to. You don't have to. If you want to see the Twitter feed, which, by the way, I try to update it when I go back to um, my office right after class. Sometimes it's a day below or a day after. Okay, but actually, um, I'm going to pull up this picture right here. This actually is going to be one of the things I'm going to post as part of the PowerPoint slides. This is a picture of the whiteboard. I'm like, how clever is that? Because we're going to continue talking about the two types of compounds, molecular compounds and ionic compounds. We're going to continue on that list. So what I started to say is you're like, dude, I don't want to do all that, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you just type in twitter.com forward slash and then the handle for this class, so twitter.com forward slash, my initials, EA Snipes, okay, underscore, and then chem122, that will get you there from any computer on the web. Okay, so it's a thought. And... Um, yeah, so as far as I'm recording the lectures, and there are some hits out there. I don't know if it's you guys or if it's somebody else or whatever, but um, they're usually successfully captured and posted on this Twitter feed, okay? But I kind of tell students, you already know this, right? Like, if you're in any class and you're like, that teacher's just not doing it for me, well, if you want to search the Internet and find some other person that can do it for you, because there's all sorts of other instructors out there po posting their stuff, Okay, so um, I kind of, I don't know if your ears were ringing uh, over break, but I kind of mentioned you guys a few times because they're like, why do you cover new stuff on the Friday before spring break? You know we're not going to remember it, and my phrase, I don't know if it was, whose problem is that? <laughs> so, um, yes, it's, it's, it's your problem. Welcome to college. So um, we'll go ahead and pick up where we left off. <coughs> kind of advance to the right slide, but like I said, what I want to do is actually, um, you know, we did all this stuff, blah, 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 blah. One of the things about this class it's, is I don't want to go too fast, but I don't want to go too slow, kind of like Goldilocks, okay. So before break, we were talking about <coughs> compounds, okay. And so compounds are right here under pure substances. A compound can be broken down to its elements using a chemical reaction. We aren't going to get to chemical reactions until unit four in here, but we need to talk more about compounds. Okay, so we said there's two types of compounds. And so here's where I'm going to go ahead and start this list over here again. Because one of the things I think is important as a chemist, or somebody who has a degree in chemistry, is you understand what, comp what, what the atoms look like when they stick together to make a repeating unit. We call it a compound. So there are molecular compounds, CPD, and there are ionic compounds. CPD is my abbreviation for compounds. And we said that if you have a, an example of a molecular compound is H2O, an example of an ionic compound is NaCl, and you guys told me that's table salt. Um, and if you have a repeating unit of an H2O, you actually have a molecule, that's what it's called. And if you have a repeating unit of a sodium, sodium chloride, your table salt, actually that repeating unit is a formula unit. <coughs> And then I kind of snicker and I said, of course, that's F U. Right. Anyway. Um, so one of the things for your next exam is I'm going to give you some formulas. And I'm going to say, is that a molecular compound or is that an ionic compound? And you're going to look for the metal, basically. So um, we're going to talk more about this today. But we're going to talk about atom A and atom B joining together. Okay, like this could be the water molecule. This could be your oxygen and your hydrogen. Okay. If these are both nonmetals, okay, actually if they're all nonmetals, if everything's nonmetals, I'll say all are nonmetals, all atoms are nonmetals, then it's probably a molecular compound. That's going to work for you probably 95-ish percent of the time, okay? And with related to that, I said hydrogen is a nonmetal for all intents and purposes. That will get you down the road, for this class anyway, okay? So if hydrogen's in it, okay, oxygen, nonmetals, are all nonmetals, 
And then over here, related to that, I said, if you have a metal, I said any metals. And this is one of the things we talked about um, last unit was we know we have a metal if it's over to the left of the jag, okay, the diagonal. Any metals, then it's an ionic compound. And then one last thing we said is um, ionic compounds are cool because when they dry, if they're solid form, they form crystal, <coughs> crystalline lattice, lattice structures. And that's that kind of alternating um, NaCl, 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 kind of in a like a stick sort of thing, and that's kind of why it's hard to really kind of pick any Na and NaCl, uh, so that we have to call it a formula unit. All right, so now on to something new. Okay, so atoms are joined together. Let no man put us under, right? Atoms are joined together, and I usually say atom A and atom B. B is not a boron; it's just a generic atom. They're joined together. And we have two options. They can be, they're joined together with chemical bonds, but there's two types of chemical bonds, okay? One type of chemical bond is called a covalent bond, and electrons are shared, okay? And I think I showed you an example last time of water, how water actually and oxygen shares some, an electron with a hydrogen, and, and, and it's a wonderful thing, okay? The other type of chemical bond is called an ionic bond. In an ionic bond, um, electrons aren't shared, an electron is actually transferred. And actually, we saw a video of that. Goodness, I think it might have been clear back in Unit 1. An electron <coughs> is transferred. So for instance, just to kind of remind you what that looks like, if for the ionic compounds, I go ahead and look at NaCl. It's kind of a cool thing. And we'll be talking more about this, obviously. Okay, You have your sodium atom and you have your chlorine atom. And, of course, sodium, if you're like, oh, sodium, a metal, a nonmetal, well, look on the periodic table. Do not be ashamed to look on the periodic table. Find the JAG, clearly identify it over here so it's a metal. What metals tend to want to do is metals tend to want to give up electrons. Okay? So, actually, we'll talk more about that. There's actually a transfer, and that's why we call we say electrons are transferred. There's a transfer specifically of one electron, okay? So if that's step one, step two would be this, where sodium now has a plus one charge because it lost one electron. Chlorine has a minus one charge because it gained one electron. So this right here, dot, 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 for some reason that is my way of showing um, an ionic chemical bond. Why is it there? An electron was transferred. Now you have a positive, uh, what we call a cation, as some of you know, and a negative, what we call an anion. We have, we have obviously charged ions. And we have dot, dot, dot. It is an ionic bond. One of the good things or bad things that depends on when I come back from spring break, so remember, I've been teaching for 12-ish years or so. After spring break, I can either be dogging it or I can be just hyper. So right now I'm hyper. So we'll just see. But that is an ionic bond. So we talked about, you know, there's this big, you know, some people will think, eh, it's a compound. Yeah, who cares if it's a molecular compound or if it's an ionic, ionic compound? You guys care for your test, right? Okay. So here's one thing about it. Um, an ionic compound must contain at least one ionic bond. At least one ionic bond. One ionic chemical bond. Okay. Um, contrast that to molecular compounds. Oh, by the way, I think this was, um, maybe it's down here at the bottom here. Molecular compounds, I'm going to, right underneath it, put in parentheses, covalent compounds. Covalent CPD. They mean the same thing. Molecular compounds and covalent compounds. You'll hear me kind of lapse back. And forth. But if you have a molecular compound where cute little atoms are joined together, then electrons are only being shared. Okay? You have, I'm going to say no ionic bonds. No ionic bonds. <coughs> Remember, those are chemical bonds. And you have all 
um, covalent bonds. It's an exciting time. So here, when um, this oxygen joins with the two hydrogens, okay, these you're going to see me draw covalent bonds as a solid line. Okay, so electrons are being shared. So these are both covalent chemical bonds. I was going to say James bond. So I guess one more thing to kind of make this complete, and I'm not going to recreate this every time, but under covalent bonds, all covalent bonds, I'm going to add um, electrons. I'll put an E with a negative sign, electrons shared. Okay, to make those, electrons are shared. And here, at least one ionic bond. Under ionic bond, I'm going to say electrons transferred. You know, if you're a visual person, that's kind of okay, electrons transferred up here. All right. Hold it. Okay. So as I hold up my fist, this is atom A and atom B. They're going to stick together with a chemical bond. I'm like, what kind of chemical bond is that going to be? Well, it all comes down to the electronegativity of these two atoms. Okay. And in physical science, we use a lot of Greek letters. Okay, so of course that this was a cap, you know, that summation sign was a capital sigma. Um, that's a Greek letter. Okay, we also use, and we're going to use it again here. Do you guys, I don't know if you remember, we used the triangle. That is the Greek letter delta. Okay, and we're going to use that again. And actually, anytime you see delta, that means change in. So this means summation which we aren't doing right now. Actually, we did summation with the average atomic weight, remember? This means change in. Yeah. You guys did the delta when you guys did the change in temperature when you looked at things transferring energy. Okay, so this is, and you pronounce it chi. This right here is the Greek letter chi, C-H-I, and it stands for electronegativity. Okay. So, electronegativity, atom A and atom B, they know they're going to make a chemical bond. What sort of chemical bond is it going to be? So, basically, it's a tug of war, is what I'd like to think of it. Um, electronegativity is a measure of if you have these two atoms, who's going to tug more on a pair of electrons? that's either going to be transferred or shared. Who's going to tug more? That's what electronegativity is. And there are these, what we call electronegativity values, and I kind of go back and forth. Linus Pauling was the dude to, to go and analyze each of those atoms, if they're bonded to another atom, how much they're going to tug on a pair of electrons. Those are electronegativity values. Okay? But we're talking about it bonding to another atom. So check this out. This is kind of cool. So over here, we said in table salt, who was going to give up the electron? It was the sodium. Sodium's going to go, dude, chlorine, you got it. Sodium is a metal. Metals tend to say, fine, I don't want that extra electron. We're going to actually call out a valence electron coming up. It's like, eh, whatever. Okay. So they have what we call low electronegativities. Chlorine said, I'll take it. You're going to see Pollen came up with a high electronegativity for the, the non-metals. Excuse me. Non-metals have high electronegativity values. Metals have low electronegativity values. So that, what we call chi or electronegativities, you're going to want to generally know the trend. And so if you just focus on the A elements, so this is important why we talked about the periodic table. What are the A elements? Okay, so you've got two columns here, not these. You've got six columns over here. So basically, shove those together, and here's the trend in electronegativity. Electronegativity increases as you get closer to the nonmetals, right? Okay. And electronegativity increases as you go up. Okay. So sometimes I kind of go like, go like this. So basically, they kind of come to a same point. 
electronegativity increases. We're going to see values here. Like I said, these were values that were established by Linus Pauling. I think he might have earned a Nobel Prize talking about basically this tug of war between two atoms. So you can kind of see the numbers on top of the um, on top of the elements up there. So for instance, the, uh, the Pauling value for the electron for electronegativity of barium is 0.9. Okay. Going across, is that astatine? Yes, astatine over there, okay, 2.1. Increases as you go from left to right across the same period and increases as you go from bottom up, okay? So actually for your homework, um, you're going to want to look at these chi or these electronegativity values, I think. This is just another, like, to kind of show you the taller it is, the higher the electronegativity. Notice that what we did is kind of like what we did with atomic size. We basically took out the B elements, the transition elements, and the inner transition elements, and we said, ah, we kind of have a little bit of a not quite clear trend there. This is my favorite one to look at when I'm trying to work problems, okay? Because remember, I said barium was 0.9, astatine, was it 2.1 over there? 2.2 here. Okay, so those are, okay, <laughs> welcome to my world, right? Uh, you know, which one's more accurate? Well, probably the other one, you know. And if you have it on a test or homework, you know, I'll take one of those, okay? So, yeah, these values are updated. So these are Pauling's values. It's a tug of war. The higher the number, the more likely it is to get the electron. The lower the number, it's like, yeah, you can have it. So not so surprising then, when we talk about electrons being shared is a covalent bond and electrons being transferred is an ionic bond, when there is a large difference between that tug of war, eh, and I'll kinda, I'm going to actually kind of put that as 1.7, okay? This large difference is going to be about 1.7, okay, electronegativity values. So um, I want to introduce you to something. So do you buy that um, large differences? Can you see where that's the change in, kind of a change in, change in electronegativity values, change in electronegativity values? You have atom A and atom B, okay? And basically, I'll go ahead and just put a line here. I don't know what kind of, kind of bond it's going to be. What you do is you look at the electronegativity of A, so I'll call that chi sub A, and the electronegativity of B, we'll call that chi sub B, okay? You look them up, and then you come up with what we call delta chi, or electronegativity difference. Okay, so we use that delta sign, electronegativity difference. And basically, it's a little subtraction. I'm going to go ahead. Some of you might be familiar with these. What are those? It's two lines. Absolute value. Absolute value. That's right. Basically, I'm going to take, if it's a negative, I'm going to turn it positive. So I just want the difference between A minus B. Okay, that is your electronegativity difference. And if that's 1.7 or greater, then dang it, the dude with the higher electronegativity is going to get the electron or electrons, okay, become negatively charged. And the one that has a low chi value or electronegativity value, it's, it's going to willingly give it up. Okay, it's going to actually become positively charged. Okay. Small differences, less than 1.7, and guess what? No electron is transferred, and electrons will be shared. So um, here we say, in the first case, your chemical bond between your two atoms, if it's atom A and atom B, will be an ionic chemical bond. In the other case, where your delta chi, your difference in electronegativity values, is less than 1.7, electrons are going to be shared. It's going to be a covalent chemical bond.
So we said that electronegativity increases from left to right, and electronegativity, as you get closer to the nonmetals, and electronegativity increases going up, okay, like that. So here's the deal then, and actually this is consistent with what I just drew up on the board over here. Basically, if you take the top one says, if you take any two nonmetals, now I just am amazed, all those elements, how many nonmetals are there? Not very many. It's kind of like a right triangle, sort of, okay, on that side of the jag. If you grab, like, um, if you grab sulfur and oxygen, check it out. If they're stuck together, that's going to be a covalent bond. If you grab nitrogen and oxygen, covalent bond. If you grab any halogen and oxygen, covalent bond. Okay? Um, phosphorus and oxygen, covalent bond. Electrons are shared. Now, down here it says if you want to have an electron transferred, you have to grab a metal and a nonmetal. And the one thing you're missing, I'm like, well, what if you have metals and metals? And the answer to that, and I chased this down some years ago to convince myself. Um, you're familiar with stainless steel? Okay. Basically, that's a solution. Stainless steel is basically kind of an assortment of metals that give you the, give you the quality that you want, and they are just kind of suspended next to each other. There's not the chemical bond between those atoms. I'm not saying it's not strong as heck, okay, but basically they heat it up in its molten form. They make a homogeneous mixture to get the quality they want, the different metals, and it's frozen like that. Isn't that cool? Okay, so to kind of emphasize, that's why I said that actually if you look for a metal, if you look for a metal, any metals in there, basically it's going to give up an electron or two or three, okay, and it's formed an ionic bond with a nonmetal in there, and that's an ionic compound. So this is just kind of a reminder to kind of come full circle here, okay. In general, if you have a metal bonded with a nonmetal, okay, the nonmetals have high electronegativity values, like, dude, I'm going to go ahead and become negatively charged. I'll take that electron. Metals gave up an electron, and you have an ionic bond, chemical bond, so it must be an ionic compound. It only takes one ionic compound, basically, to contaminate the whole thing. When we get uh, in this unit, I'm going to definitely show you some uh, compounds. You, know, you write the formula for the compound, and if you kind of look closely at the compound, most of the chemical bonds are covalent, but if only one chemical bond is ionic, it's an ionic compound. Okay? Um, but then the other thing is, and there are a lot of compounds, it's amazing for those of you who are going into the life sciences, it's amazing the chemistry you can get out of um, oxygen and uh, carbon and hydrogen, a lot of different compounds. Those would all be molecular compounds. Electrons are shared when those things get together. So you're probably okay with delta chi. Delta means change in, just like we change in temperature, delta. And chi means electronegativity. So basically you have atom A and atom B. You've looked up their polling value or their electronegativity value. You did the little subtraction. You took the absolute value of that. Okay. And I said that if it's 1.7 or greater, electronegativity difference is 1.7 or greater, then that chemical bond just between those two atoms is ionic. These, on the other hand, leading up to 1.7, are all examples of electrons being shared. Electrons are being shared if the difference is not 1.7. And I say 1.7, it's like in stone. It's not in stone. Depends on which chemist you talk to, kind of what their day's like, I don't know. Okay. But that's kind of the threshold we use. So those are all covalent bonds well, where electrons are shared between atom A and atom B. But here's the cool part. Okay. If you have, for instance, an electronegativity difference, that's 1.2, electrons are going to be shared, but they won't be shared equally. The atom that has the high polling value basically is going to run around with what we call a partial negative, okay? It's going to have a negative end and a positive end, okay? Water is great like that. Let me go ahead and pick on water and show you. 
So let's see, we have, for a water molecule, we have hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. You figure these, these chemical bonds should be similar, right? Okay. So these electrons are being shared because there's two nonmetals. I said hydrogen is a nonmetal. Okay. Um, and I think I might have it coming up right now. Somebody help me out. Give me the polling value for oxygen. Delta, oops, delta. Delta chi, like a negative difference, right here. It's a 3.5. Thank you. 3.5, that is for oxygen. Mm -hmm. And what is it for hydrogen? 2.1. Two point one. Okay. I get one point four. Okay, so that's electronegativity different. It's less than one point seven, but it's it's pushing it, right? So here's the cool thing about it. The oxygen that has a high electronegativity, it runs around, and what we do is we use a lowercase delta for some reason to show its negativeness. So we go, this actually means partial. So it's what we say partially negative, and this is what we call partially positive. There's another one. Well, really physical scientists, let's just say it was partial. Okay. So this kind of looks like a, an S with an extra thing. Okay, and it's a, another delta. Okay, there's two deltas. I think this is the lowercase one, and it means partial. I'll go ahead and say partial B has that. So we say the oxygen is partially negative, the hydrogen is partially positive. Is it clear? Is it an ion? No. Is, are the electrons shared equally? No. Are they shared? Yes. Okay, so those are um, those, those two chemical bonds in a water molecule are covalent. I love those chemical bonds. Okay, so here's atom A and atom B. These are just these are just uh, compounds that have two atoms. So um, if you take any, remember those those seven diatomic elements, the Hopper nickel. Okay, so we could call that two hydrogen atoms, for instance. Okay, so you guys told me the pollen value for hydrogen is two point one. 2.1 minus 2.1 is zero. So that's what we call a, a perfectly covalent um, uh, bond. Okay. I have some real things coming up here. All right. So this actually is trying to kind of show you what I did with water. Notice the kind of the curvy sort of partial sign there? It's just saying that you're, and they have it, here the, the non-metal here on the left and the metal here on the right. Is electron transferred? No. Are they shared equally? No. <laughs> okay, so it, it brings what we call a high degree of polarity. So here are some examples. Okay, instead of H2, we're going with Cl2. Remember, chlorine is one of those things that likes to pair up. Okay, so that chemical bond between those two chlorine atoms, of course, they have the same polling value, so delta chi are changing like the negativity difference is zero. Okay, so that is definitely on the low scale. Um, if we were to look up the electronegativity value for sodium and chlorine, okay, let's go ahead and do it. So I'm looking at this right here. I want to evaluate that. Okay, so I'm going to look at the electronegativity. Somebody, can you give it to me again for chlorine? 3.0. 3.0, thanks. And then the electronegativity for sodium? 0 0.9. 0 0.9? Yep, 0 0.9. Thank you. All right, so I get a difference of 2.1. Okay. So electronegativity difference that's greater than 1.7. Now, again, the 1.7, eh, you know, it's probably debatable. But it's kind of a ballpark. And then something in between. If we were to look up uh, for hydrogen and chlorine, actually we have it here, don't we? Um, for hydrogen, it's 
2.1. For chlorine, it's 0.9. 12, 1.2. Okay. So, all right. So, just to kind of beat you over the head with it, I feel like I am. Okay, it's only because. Okay. But if a compound's formula contains um, both a metal and a non metal, then you know an electron's going to be transferred from the metal to the non metal. Okay? And so, somewhere in that mess, you have an ionic chemical bond, and if you have any ionic bond, then it's an ionic uh, compound. Um, if you have only a mess of nonmetals, and remember I told you for purposes, and I'll just kind of give you the important exception probably Wednesday or Friday, for all intents and purposes, hydrogen is a nonmetal. Okay, H is nonmetal. Um, so if you have a mess of nonmetals, which definitely there's a lot of compounds like that, then your compound is a covalent compound or molecular compound. Those are some All right, so let's take a look at these. I know it's weird because these are in two different chapters, but it, it really does work, trust me. Was it nine? No. What was six? What was that last slide? What did it say? Under the assignments, what was the? Oh, the page number? Five. No. Like, what does? Oh. Yeah, you're at five, five four, four, six, and three. I had this all set up, and then my, they decided to be dumb, so I had to restart my laptop, but I think it's working now. All right, so 46 looks like something you're going to run into in the test. Very helpful. Kind of know it's kind of small up here, but it basically gives you some formulas and asks you if those formulas are formulas of ionic compounds or molecular compounds. So you're going to look for the metal. I have my periodic table handy. Sometimes I don't remember the sodium. I think, oh, that sounds like a metal. No, it's a metal. Okay. Um, and then 50. I wonder it's, it might not show it to me because it's because of how I opened it. But you get the idea. I think it's similar. All right, and then chapter ten. Mm -hmm. so these will all be due Wednesday. Usually, homework in here is really helpful for a number of things, including doing well on your exams. A good way to review for your exams. Not that I'm trying to teach to the test, but, oh, come on. Oh, I know, it's over here. It only did what I asked it to do. Um, so was that 90? What question are those? Oh, um, chapter 10, question 80 and 82. Oh, and 78. 78, too. Yeah, 78. 78, okay, thanks. Uh, well... I wonder if it'll, how hard that is. I thought I was being sneaky. Oh my gosh. So, like, hold up your hands. How many passwords does everybody out there have? Probably got about 
12 different passwords. I don't know. They're like, really? Dang. Change them all. Change them all? Oh, man. It's terrible. All right. Now this should work fine. 78. Would you play? This is on this page. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. So, we're supposed to say what the electronegativity values for fluorine, carbon, and sulfur are. Do you think you need to memorize these for the test? Okay. 78 and 80? Yep. Okay. Um, you know, look up the electronegativity values for those five elements and put them in order of. Um, increasing electronegativity, and then what? Uh, 82. 82. Yep, so okay, 82. finally here you get to do a little bit of subtraction. So 82 says, look up, for instance, there's your atom A and your atom B. There's your pair of atoms that are going to be bonded together somewhere in your molecule or formula unit. Look them up and calculate the delta chi. So that's what that is. Electronegativity differences. Oh, okay. so just classifying if it's pure covalent? Oh, I'm glad you, yeah. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, no, so no. Let, me, <laughs> let me amend that. You're right, I do see that now. I want you to do two things. I want to see on your homework, I want you to see your delta chi calculated. Please. Because only once you calculate the delta chi can you go ahead and classify yeah, it as, yeah. So this table right here is similar to the table I showed you with the kind of the four types of, five types, five types of covalent bonds and an ionic bond. So say if it's um, purely covalent, the delta chi would be zero. Ionic, you're looking at a delta chi that's greater than 1.7. Um, and then if it's, uh, if it's between zero and 1.7, um, actually there is probably a degree of what we call polarity to it, and that's how it's deal with, with water. Okay, All right, so we'll go ahead and end there. Um, now, go ahead and bring your thinking caps on Wednesday. I won't, I try not to go too fast on Wednesday, but on Wednesday I want to get far enough so that Thursday's lab makes even more sense. So Thursday's lab, we are going to do, um, if you're looking at it in your lab manuals, it's that, um, it's called nomenclature. So Thursday's lab is an important one not to miss. Nomenclature, since we have a few minutes, but you're fine, you can go ahead and pack up. But I'll tell you that nomenclature on your unit three exam, is about a quarter or a, about a quarter of your grade on your unit three exam is no approach. That's what we're going to cover in lab on Thursday. I will leave. I know you have. Yeah. But.